days and celebrations to many people and there is a day for everything you know there is a i heard there is a international u turn day you know so there is a day for everything so there is a father's day mother's day in you know, all kinds of days so sometimes something is good you know just pause and uh, thank and look back and sometimes but many people those are the most difficult times of their lives also and so we address in both ways we want to be sensitive in both ways we want to celebrate at the same time we want to be sensitive about the emotions and needs of others also so mother's day we set apart in you know, on saturdays we celebrate and sunday we come together to do to worship the lord also at the same time as we said you know there are different roles that uh, every woman in this church that uh, do and we want to thank the lord for them we honor them and we want to glorify god and thank the lord for you and i think that that is the right approach to do thank the lord for every one of you over here all our uh, girls to the women and uh, sisters and all those things motherhood is one of important thing but we think that motherhood is not only the thing and nobody people will not be mothers they don't want to be mothers or various reason they would be mothers so we understand as a scripture teaches that it is it is part of it but it's not all of it and so we again celebrate every one of us who we are in christ our identity in christ that is what we want to celebrate together when it come to christian them there are two approaches that the people have towards uh, the women and uh, we see that there is one group of people called the egalitarians and they believe there is no gender distinction and whatsoever at all they are one in christ so there is no interchangeable roles as it comes uh, to the ministry or the leadership whether it is a home or society or the church so egalitarians believe that the essential value of uh, of women and there is no gender distinction there is another group of people those who believe called complementarians they also believe the same thing there is no we all are have intrinsic value in christ we are one in christ there is no gender distinction in essence or in uh, importance or value or any of those things at all but there are functional roles that god has ordained as women and men that is what the complementarians uh, believe and that functional roles that comes you know in uh, in house in uh, society in church and all and that functional role that we can see as a model in the trinity itself if the son subject or submit to the father and the father the, the holy spirit submit to the father and the son that doesn't mean that they are subordinate to one another rather they all have equal they are co-equal and co-eternal the same way we understand that we are diverse and we are created as men and women with the various functional roles within the body within the house and within the society also in that matter we are complementarians that's why we understand the scripture that is what we believe also so there is no uh, difference between us but there are functional roles within the community also today i just want to bring something from uh, gospel of matthew chapter 1 verse 1 through 6 gospel of matthew chapter 1 verse 1 through 6 and this is a boring chapter that any of you read continue to read the bible this chapter only you read when you are continue to read the bible Now, at the same time also we skip that part also that we see because this all about uh, genealogy the ancestry nowadays actually because of this uh, an increase of technology people try to find out who they are you have heard there's a dna test ancestry.com and all kinds of stuff actually we recently talked to people they said i am 2% age european 80% is asian and 22% of this you know they boast in all those things and we are the descendants those who came from the mayflower ship actually and those who are indians those who are syrian christians we say that we are saint thomas christians you know and we are brahmins those days actually and now we are this because of that there's a big controversy that happened in kerala recently also we are kesavan nayar you know we are somebody that is different we are we are boasting in their past and they think that that's that's a human tendency you know people used to say about their life and you ask them actually you know anybody is famous and rich we try to connect with them as actually that is my uh, younger son's uh, brother in law's father in law's sister's neighbor you know they are very close to us you know so people boast in their future in their their past and they want to say that they came from that 
but we read here in matthew you know there is a genealogy that is very interesting that we can see when we showcase something what we try to do you know we of course we want to talk about the proverbs 31 women and we are that noble character and we are perfect and beautiful and successful those are the things always we try to do but here surprisingly we something that is different where we see the grandmothers of jesus in the in this genealogy and this genealogy that four women that matthew is uh, writing and he is not just writing about the great women like uh, sarah or rebecca or rachel or jochebed or uh, hana or uh, you know like uh, timothy's grandmother and mother none of those people he is very unique uh, people that we see over here that is what we are going to look into let us read this actually i don't know you are interested to read this but let us read that at least that first uh, six uh, verses the matthew chapter 1 verse 1 through 6 look at the screen or your bible you can see those verses this is the genealogy of jesus the messiah the son of david the son of abraham abraham was the father of isaac isaac the father of jacob jacob the father of judah and his brothers judah the father of perez and sarah whose mother was tamar perez the father of hesron hesron the father of ram ram the father of amaniadab amaniadab the father of nashon nashon the father of salmon salmon the father of boaz whose mother was rehab boaz the father of obed whose mother was ruth obed the father of jesse and jesse the father of king david david was the father of solomon whose mother's had been uriah's wife names names and lot of names some of the names we can't even pronounce at all jacob koshi tangachan was easy actually but these are hebrew names some names we cannot even pronounce some people we don't know even know who they are actually you know some of those names are very interesting we don't know who they are some names are very famous jacob solomon jehoshaphat and those kinds of names are very very famous but again we see a human tendency and nature here actually this is looking like a reading a phone book right how many of you are excited to read the phone book nowadays there is no phone book by the way but there is something called the phone book yellow books those days <laughs> so we don't interest it at all right unless our name is not there nobody want to read at all now that is selfishness also human being when you see a group picture where do you look first actually if i am there or not if i am not there i am not interested at all right that is for human nature so our names are not there who cares then right my name is not there i don't want to read this names at all but this is important why this is important there is a three sets of 14 generations of people that we see over here let us look into briefly there is some information and there is only one thing i want to say today only one point of all these things we want to make it today but the information is important as we go there the genealogies are important for jewish people why because for jews it is important because for the understand their tribal membership that enable them to inherit their possession so they won't just sell property like we do because this was handed over to the mass families and they belong to the mass we read in book of joshua we see that this land was divided to people tribe by tribe so they want to know that make sure this belong to this tribe so their understanding of where they come from is important to them not only that they are priesthood but the priests are coming from where they are coming from levites so in order to understand that who is a priest especially after they lost their identity their captivity all kinds of stuff that we see that they are going back and forth this genealogy is very very important to them and also the monarchy the kings are coming from judah right so they want to know that which tribe these kings are coming from so tribes are very important to jewish people also not only that it is to show in the scripture we see that several genealogies in different places that tells us many things to us number one it tells us that god is interested in people this is a story of us the story of people so it is important to god not only that it is a progression of revelation god is working from generations to generations god is working through generations so it is important it is a vital role and not only that it is to prove the identity of jesus 
So that is what we see in Matthew that G Matthew is writing over here. Not only that, Matthew is very particular writing and starting with the genealogy. Out of the four Gospels that we see that, Matthew is the one who takes the interest writing this genealogy. Why? Because he is addressing to the Jewish people. So when he starts that he is establishing that the royal family of David. And he proves that Jesus come from that. Chapter 1 verse 1 it says, this is the genealogy of whom? Genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, son of David, the son of Abraham. Chronologically who comes first? Abraham comes first. But here it says that it is David. Because for a skeptical Jew, the identity of Jesus, a direct descendant from David is very crucial to accept him as the Messiah. I remember that in Jesus time, Jesus was not only one who claimed as the Messiah. There are so many other people claim they are being Messiah. So how do they root it out? It is who the one is right or wrong. One way they understand that he come from the lineage of David. So Matthew starts with the telling that that is where Jesus started the direct descendant of David. Not only that it demonstrates Jesus Christ historical roots. Jesus didn't came to the scene all of a sudden as a just drop from heaven. Rather as Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman born under the law. So Matthew writes that Jesus had a family tree. And he came down at the perfect moment of history and he came in Bethlehem. And Matthew writes not only that this is the grace of record of the grace of God. This is the record of the grace of God. Look at these people here. Every one of them. Every one of them. Not only these four women that is mentioned here. Look at every person here. Abraham, the friend of God. But he lied about his wife. His son repeated the same mistake. Then we see Jacob, the master deceiver. Right? Every person. Judah, as we read in Genesis 38, the fornicator. David, the adulterer. Every person, Manasseh, the evilest, if that is superlative of evil, the evilest king that ever Judah had or Israel had. So all these people, none of them are not eligible to be in this list at all. But their names are listed or here. A murderer, a fornicator, an adulterer, a liar, a deceiver. All these people make the list. What that tells us here. There is no one else can boast. This is the pure and pure mercy and the grace of God. That is what we want to repeat again and again. Three paragraphs that we see in Matthew chapter 1. Abraham to David. Then David to Babylon in captivity. Babylon in captivity to Jesus time. So that is what we read in verse 17. So what happened one after the another. The first part that we see Abraham to David. The mercy of God. And then we see people misunderstood the grace of God and they forsake God they defied the, the land they disobeyed the law of God and they did all these things God punished them so we see the judgment of God but God didn't forsake them we see the faithfulness of God also there so if you write a graph there we can see in the high and the low points of the history of Israel the mercy of God the judgment of God and finally they come back to the faithfulness of God also but look at these four women. And again, there is so much we can talk about that. Just want to show them. And we'll come to that, what we can learn from their lives. Look at here, the genealogy over here. There are four strange women. Including women in the genealogy itself is something miraculous for them. You know, because they were not valued at all in their society. So four women. Four, who are the four women? Tamar, Rehab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Tamar, Rehab, Ruth and Bathsheba. And I, I, we can stand here and explain every story of it actually. We don't have the time to do that. I hope and assume that most of you know the stories in the scripture. We read in Genesis chapter 38 about Tamar. Judah uh, the forsake the, the covenant relationship and he went with the Canaanite woman and uh, Shia and uh, he got married with her and he had three sons, Ur, Onan and Shelah. Again interesting names over there. And those who are looking for names, you know, there are good names here. <laughs> so, Sunil and Priyanka, we can encourage them to look at all these names. In the genealogy list, actually, it is easy to find out. I see these names. And what happened? Judah and uh, uh, his uh, son Ur got married with the Tamar. But he died. 
and later according to their custom one son dies the other one redeem the, the wife and to carry again the lineage and the hereditary of the family and he also onan also died but tamar said there is no one else to take care of that and she went back to her father's house or a judah ask her to go also and later that we see that she disguised herself as a shrine prostitute and seduced her father in law judah and they had a two a twins or two boys in their relationship called perez and sarah look at the story again nobody look good at all in this story and you have hundreds of questions as you only focus on chapter 38 of genesis there is lot of questions lot of moral questions that we can see at all but the only thing we can point out here none of them do deserve not judah not tamar not his their children but all of them are in the list that's only one thing that to remember then we see the second person over there that is also very interesting joshua chapter 2 we all know the story also we we'll have to stay here to explain much now joshua is the leader he is going to the uh, promised land he sent two spies to explore jericho because jericho, jericho was a strategic place for these people they have to defeat the city then only they are able to go further so the, he sent the spies over there and the spies end up in the rehab's house and who was rehab every time rehab's name is mentioned it says that she was a harlot and that was old english a nice way to present it it is she was a prostitute and that is what we read in the scripture and she hired these people when the leaders sent to to look for the spies she told them a lie and said what they are already left that's what she said did and finally they made an agreement to each other and to tie a scarlet or the over the or the uh, their house and when they invade the land her and family will be spared that's what it look at all those events over there what are happen she is a canaanite woman and secondly she is a prostitute and thirdly what she did she lied <laughs> and when we come to hebrew it is very interesting very hard to understand there in hebrew chapter 11 says that by faith rehab what lied <laughs> that is interesting right some people make you know by faith people lie also they exaggerate their things you know even they they think they look like they are helping god but this is interesting it's not making any sense whatsoever at all a canaanite prostitute a liar by faith <laughs> her name is also where in the genealogy of jesus christ look at what we are trying to understand here not just the perfect people not at everything you know put it together that is the list that we see then the third person that we see of course ruth out of these four people ruth may be a decent lady there is no doubt about that at all but her lineage is also from corrupted blood where she come from she is a moabite and they also came from a ancestral relationship that we see from loth and his descendants so in that sense she not supposed to be here at all lot ruth choice that is a marvelous thing that we can learn that also there but she was also a moabite let us go further there and we see in uh, the, the fourth woman that is interesting there fourth woman and there matthew writes like this david was the father of solomon whose mother had been uriah's wife after thousand years David invaded another man's bedroom. He had a royal cover up for a year. He did all kinds of stuff. Since God loved him, God confronted him. He repented of his sin. And then Bathsheba became the wife of David. David tried to cover up very nicely actually, right? The moment Uriah died, he went with the press there, he just married her. CNN had a report that said that what a wonderful king is this, right? He is trying to rescue the widow of the soldier. This is the way the king should be. But in God's record, that was recorded and that was there forever. Thousand years later, when the Holy Spirit writes about the identity of this woman, he didn't write that it was David's wife, it was still whom? Still it is Uriah's wife. So one thing there, just, just one thing to remind you. how great and how the holy spirit how god view marriage and the covenant relationship that we see over here how god view marriage it was not david's wife it was still uriah's wife you did it because he could 
That's a different thing. God forgive our sins. But the consequences always follow us. God forgive our sins. But the consequences always follow us. We may have to pay a price. When you write, study the story of David, the declining stage started ever since from there. Years later, the Holy Spirit writes that. So that is a good warning we have to take also. But that is not the point here. But I think that the Holy Spirit is stressing that thing to all of us here. We can be nice before people, but God sees our heart and he sees who we are and what we do. It is very important also over here. Look at this fourth woman. It is Bathsheba. Let's come back to these things again. Four unlikely women. Tamar, Rehab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Tamar, immorality, prostitution, a Gentile, incest. Rehab, lying, deception, a Canaanite woman. Ruth, coming from a, again, the stained blood, from incest, from for forefathers. Bathsheba, with uh, adultery. Three women, three Gentiles, th three of them involved some kind of immorality. Two are involved in prostitution. One is an adulteress, but all four end up in Jesus' genealogy. Why? Why? Again, as we think that, we want to showcase always a successful and beautiful and famous and all the things put it together. But I think that God looks in a different way many things. God not only look your success in one way or the other, but God look the entire thing. God look the history. And not only God look the history, God is looking the, the future also. Look at this thing. What are the things we can learn about it? I think that many of the times, especially we are living a lot of pressure. And we don't have the strength to carry on. Many of you look like you are invisible. You know, you have more hands to do the things. But you may think that I may amount to anything. He, I am valuable. I am worthy. He says, good. There is any point of doing all these things. We may have all kinds of questions. But look at from this genealogy, what can we learn? Number one, I think we can learn that the genealogy shows the sheer mercy of God. And Matthew writes his people and tells us that God is bigger than the Jewish race. God is not a sexist. God is not only for one group of people. You look back, these are the people God used through, as God promised to Abraham, through you, all the people will be blessed. And that is what God is doing through this. All these people, not only just one group of people, not only that we see that there we read, you know, Jesus, the Matthew writes here, and we understand that God's mercy is bigger than our sins. God's mercy is bigger than our sin. Ordinary people here. But we see that many times we may feel, sometimes, you know, we cannot change our past whatsoever at all. What is past is past. Some of you think that I didn't come from that kind of a family. I don't have that kind of a heritage. You know, I came from this kind of things. I am ashamed to admit those things. That may be one of you or some of us may be thinking. Anybody understand and feel my pain and my family? You know, if I am redeemable in any way. But here we see God's mercy is greater. You don't have to be born in that place and to be you know, upbringing in such a way. And God has mercy upon us. And that is why we partake from communion. That's why we come together this morning in God's presence. We can enter into his presence simply because of God's mercy. This unlikely woman teaches us that we all are able to or we all are recipients of God's pure mercy into our lives. Second thing that we see over here, we have God not only with us, we have a God who redeems us. We have a God who redeems us. There is 7,000 plus promises that is mentioned in the scripture. And each of those promises, Bible says that the Lord is faithful to all his promises. God made a promise to Abraham. And God said, through you, all the people will be blessed. And God is doing exactly that and he is redeeming. People became unfaithful. Abraham became a liar. And his descendants went away from God in various ways. But God remained faithful. And God overlooked the, the, the forgotten. 
and god look and values the overlooked and god values you and me but i think that one more lesson children we can lesson over we can learn over here is this godliness cannot be inherited at all godliness cannot be inherited every generation every person how to make the choice he can do everything you know you can do it but is the, the progression you see in the people of israel is that generation after generation they are running away from god many times each of you you happen to be born in a godly home thank the lord for that you have a praying mother praise the lord for that there is a mother who stand on the knees for you thank the lord for that but that will not make you a christian <laughs> that will not bring godliness automatically into you that you got that environment always grateful for that your father is not a drunkard your wife is your mom is not a runaway praise the lord for that but that will not make you a godly person it is your choice it is your choice but one more thing i don't know if this is you know you accept it or not but remember that other thing the parents have to understand that godly parents don't necessarily make godly kids either godly parents not necessarily make godly children so sometimes we think that we do all these things that is what automatically happen no there is an age of accountability come it is their choice you and i may not do anything whatsoever at all we see in parenting people used to say that the first years we are just the caretakers the second times of their life we are the controllers to them do this do, don't do that all kinds of stuff when they come to the teenage years we are just a coach only we cannot play for them we can teach them how to play it is their responsibility when they are 20 and above you are just a consultant only you have nothing much you can do you just consult <laughs> if they ask you give an answer if you don't ask you thank the lord for them that's all you can do so remember that so godliness will not be inherited in such a way but one thing that we see god is faithful to his promises when you pray when you cry god make a promise with you and god will fulfill that promise and what we do then don't forsake them we keep on pray that is as a church we believe in praying for the next generation we cry for them we intercede for them it is our responsibility because god assured us that god will not allow our children to run away it is our responsibility to continue to pray for that also but if you think that the past is so bad i will not be able to be redeemable in that way but those who come to jesus he give a new beginning Jesus with the Jesus there is a new beginning god can change something beautiful out of it this tamar or this rehab or this ruth or this betsheba the story is nobody can change it is already there but through them god can do something different if they repent and come to the lord the third lesson we can learn i believe is this he did this send a message to all the self righteous people remember that the sarcasm that the pharisees always brought to jesus was he always isn't he is the son of the carpenter isn't he is the son of mary what is the connotation that they bring over there tell some that he is came from the out of wedlock look at us we have a pure blood we are you know we are wonderful people look at our heritage they challenge jesus many occasions actually we been slaves to anyone also told we been free people always this is a royal race that is what they think but matthew writes us no there is nothing to boast at all let us look back few more generations your great grandfather abraham was a liar by the way your great father abraham the pet uh, jacob the patriarch was a master deceiver he has an md he has a master deceiver he was such a person so there is nothing to boast there is a self righteousness somehow always creep into our heart also right some days you pray more some days you read the scripture regularly when you have quiet time you keep it straightly those days your prayer are little different actually you look at god's face and look at god i am straight all these things right you know other days we have asked for god's mercy but many times we do things we think that we are perfect no none of us will never god may speak to our self righteousness and looking and putting our face the scripture tells us that again and again and again so one thing i want to say it is god's grace it is god's mercy it is none of us didn't receive at all and not only that let's go further here it is show that god is the hero of the story god is the 
hero of the story. Look at all these people here. Every one of them. At the end of the day, what it tells us? It is again because of God. Remember brothers, my sisters, anything you want to accomplish, God is the hero. It is his ability. You are here today, gone tomorrow. That is all we are. There is nothing more than that at all. They can boast they have great rulers and kings in their ancestry. But they were great sinners also again. They were great sinners also. That is what they record. But the story is always, the hero is always God. When we come to our salvation, that is what we understand. We couldn't do anything with our own effort at all. But God sent his son. Paul writes to Corinthians like this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet you, for your sake he became poor. That you through his poverty, you become rich. And you and I become rich spiritually. How? It is because of he became poor. The story is about him. Salvation is a story not about you are getting into heaven. It is about God rescue us. It is always the hero is God. He, will, he Everything belongs to him. The glory and honor belongs to him and him alone. Number five, we'll go further here fast. He did it so that the focus will be always on Christ. It is not the faith of Abraham. It is not the obedience of Moses. It is not the standing in the, the, the heart of David. The story is about what? It is about Christ. And it is about his story. To many, to this world today, sometimes we talk about Jesus. He is too pure for you to come. That is true. He is a sinless son of God. He is a sinless son of God. But, but Matthew writes to us, to these people here, to this audience, what he tells us. He can come to him. Why? He can identify with you and me. He was didn't drop from heaven like that. Rather, he also born to this lineage. There is a corrupted blood in his genealogy. He can identify with you. That is the message. If you think that you are not redeemable, your past is terrible and horrible. But Jesus says that the Son of Man came to seek, to save that which was lost. He understands how you feel. He knows that how loneliness looks like. He knows that why, how it can be ridiculed by other people about your identity. He understands all those things. He stand there. And he stand there. His family tree was not decorated over with the, not, but with the notable sinners. But remember that. Jesus can identify with each of us. So out of these four women, the Bible record here. We could have talked about many other people about Mother's Day. But look at these four women. They were accepted, adopted into the lineage, in the genealogy of Jesus. This morning, I don't think that anyone of all of us can say here, or any of you can say that, I am the proper 31 woman. How many of you can say that? We wish that want to be. That is our goal. But that is our aim. We want to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. But there is always challenges. There is failures. There is sin. We cannot mark up many times. But God, rich in his mercy, because of his great love, he redeemed us. That's why we come here together to worship. That is what we do week after week. And so this morning, this is what I want to say again and again. And if you feel that in such a way, I am not pounding up, you know, sometimes you beat us ourselves, we live with that tendency of like, uh, you know, constantly we beat us ourselves, we live with that persecution complex, we do like a martyr mentality, no matter how much we do, we think that it's not enough. But remember, it is not only how much you do, it is the grace of God. But I want to balance this again. That doesn't mean that you and I can just leave any way you want because God is merciful. That's not right. That's not right. That's not what it says. We are saved by the grace of God. But the grace always teaches us to say no to the worldliness and to say yes and obey the laws of God. So grace is not a license to sin. But the grace instructs us also as the scripture teaches but we come with a repentant heart before the Lord. God is there to accept us as we are. So this morning as we come together in God's presence, 
I don't know what is your attitude. Regardless of anything in your life you perceive. If you see that there is a hindrance that you are not able to come before God. I want to say that, we want to say together that it is God's grace is available to all of us. In spite of your origin, in spite of your ancestry, in spite of your past sins, in spite of your present life conditions, in spite of your future plans, in spite of anything, God accepts us as we are. That is what makes us. That is only that makes us eligible to come before God. This morning, will you please turn to the Lord and thank Him, let make Him the hero of your life. Let that be our prayer this morning as we are going to partake from the communion this morning. None of us are eligible to come before God. But it is the sure mercy and the pure grace of God. Would you please thank the Lord for that. And anyone who live in regret, you cannot change the past. Don't beat us yourself. I could have done this, I could have done that. It is not you. It is the choices of people. It is every generation have to choose for themselves, mothers. But you pray, you cry, you shed tears. That tears as values also. So we are going to partake from communion. And we believe that everyone, those who are here.